Yo, she's like. <laughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the hearing of the City Council Committee on for Hire Vehicles. I am Ruben Diaz Sr., the chair of the committee. Today, we will be conducting a hearing on three pieces of legislation. First, intro number 1302, a bill which I have sponsored will would amend the administrative code of, of the city of New York in relation to establishing a minimum base rate for trips dispatched by high volume for higher service in the congestion zone. My bill will require the Taxi and Limousine Commission to establish a minimum base rate that must be charged for a trip dispatched by any high volume for higher service that begins, ends, or passes through the congestion zone. It will also require that the minimum base rate must be no less than the initial unit charge for a taxi and any required taxes, fees, or surcharges. Since beginning, since becoming chair of this committee, one of my primary goals has been to establish parity across the industry and to bring fairness and economic stability for all drivers. Some have argued that the congestion pricing surcharge implemented by the state last year and which will have taken effect this month if not for a lawsuit some have charged that that dispro disproportionately affects taxi because for higher vehicles do not have meet meter, meter, meter fares and do not need to pass the cost of the fee directly onto the passengers. This, my friends, creates an uneven level playing field, which is contrary to the goals that I have set as a chair of this committee. The two other bills being considered today related to panic buttons inside taxis um, for higher vehicles. First, introduction 1319, sponsored by our majority leader, council member Laurie Combo of Brooklyn, will amend the administrative code of the city of New York in relation to the stress signal for passengers in taxi cab street, hail liveries, and for hire vehicles. The bill will require all taxi cab, hail vehicle, liveries, black cars, and luxury limousine to have a panic button installed that will allow passengers to send a distress signal to law enforcement. The other bill, introduction number 967, sponsored by Council Member Andy King of the Bronx, will amend the administrative code of the City of New York in relation to panic buttons for drivers of taxi cab street hail livery and for hire vehicles. This will require taxi street hail liveries and for hire. Sorry. Uh, where was I? The other, let me start. The other bill, introduction 967, sponsored by Council Member Andy King of the Bronx, who just arrived will amend the administrative code of the city of New York in relation to panic buttons for drivers of taxi cab, street hail, liveries, and for hire vehicles. This bill will require taxis 
Street hail livery is on for hire vehicle to have a panic button within reach of the driver to notify the police department when the driver is in distress. So we have one big requiring panic button for the passenger and another big requiring panic button for the driver. So they both have panic button. This is the panic button era. So that means that if the driver is in, is in distress, the driver could push the button. And if the passenger is in distress, the passenger could push the button. Anyway, before I call off the first panel and ask be sponsor, I will ask, before let me see my, the members of the, of the committee here today are uh, Council Member Ballon, Council Member Rose, and uh, we also been joined by Council Member Andy King, who is the sponsor of one of the bills, and I would like him to say a few words. Good morning, and uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, by the way, you are the panic button for the drivers. Yeah, I'm the panic button for the driver. Okay. <laughs> so the panic button for the for the passenger didn't come here. No, uh, no but at the end okay. of the day, we'll right. put it all in one car. So. Okay. Uh, but I want to say thank you, Mr. Chair, for your energy this morning. Um, this is a serious topic that we are addressing, and I want to thank the panel for coming in to give your expert testimony. But today is all about intro 967 as well as the others, which will mandate a panic button bill for all for hire vehicles licensed by TLC, creating a means to help those drivers and individuals in distress by signaling a system that connects the driver to NYPD in that department. And why? For the safety of all those professionals. When livery driver Richard DeLeon's car and the passengers were attacked by a knife in 2017, he did everything possible to protect those three passengers and his head. His thumb was cut off. Last year, a man believed, believed the yellow cab cut him off in Astoria. And when he pulls over, the guy parks his car and goes out to threaten him. The suspect then pulls a blade and slashes the cabbie's tire. Mr. Singh, a taxi driver, was assaulted by some bigot racist drunks, called him slurs, and robbed him of his religious turban and in the Bronx while trying to collect the fare after a long ride from Manhattan. They punched this man and attempted to destroy his vehicle. A driver in the Bronx shot three times by a passenger carrying a gun who ran off with his cash and wallet before he stumbled out of his vehicle to wave a passing police cruiser, which was luckily nearby at the time. What had happened if he wouldn't have been so lucky? So when I hear Brother Jay Colon, Camacho, excuse me, family, a father of three, shot eight times while at taken, cab drivers with a number of stories, being forced to drive to addresses that don't exist, only to be robbed, their cars to be taken away from, or be beaten. This is a serious situation. And we need to make sure that these New Yorkers, that New Yorkers count on every day to move them around to and fro are protected and being able to go home and provide for their families. So today's legislation is about protecting New Yorkers who serve New Yorkers each and every day. It's not there's no way to play games. So and while we will check out the fiscal impact of what this can have on the driver, I offer today that we as a city should do all that we can fiscally. If there's a fiscal impact, then as we provide funding for education, as we provide funding for transportation, as we provide funding for safety, this is one of those things that we need to provide funding for safety if there is a fiscal impact. And there should be no fiscal impact to the driver as we attempt to save their lives. So that being said, I want to thank you, Mr. Chair, for holding today's conversation. I look forward to a spirited conversation to an end to save the lives of our New York drivers. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member, for your leadership and uh, desire to help the industry. Thank you. Now I am going to ask the, the Council to take the oath. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to Council Member questions? Yep. I do. Thank you. Okay, good morning, Chair Diaz. Good morning, members of the For Hire Vehicle Committee and Council Member King. I'm Bill Heinzen, the Deputy Commissioner for Policy and External Affairs at the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission. Joining me today from TLC is Diana Panetti, who is the Deputy Commissioner of TLC's Uniform Services Bureau. And we are here today to share TLC's views on intros 967, 1319, 
and 1302. Uh, TLC takes very seriously the safety of its passengers and of its drivers. Our mission is to ensure that all New Yorkers receive safe, reliable, and accessible for hire service, which includes keeping passengers and drivers safe. To protect the riding public, TLC requires that all drivers of TLC licensed vehicles must obtain a license to carry passengers, whether in yellow, green, livery, black car, commuter van, or lux limo. To obtain that license, drivers must meet very stringent standards, such as fingerprinting, and we're pretty unique in the country on this, and we're proud of that. Um, a criminal background check, a New York State Department of Motor Vehicle driving record check, drug testing, driver education courses. Additionally, to ensure safe rides for drivers and passengers, TLC always urges them to not engage in illegal street hail activity. For drivers, these all cash trips, and they are of necessity all cash, these trips are unrecorded, making it that much more difficult for the police or for TLC to locate the assailant and indeed, a person with bad intent may actually be trying to hail a ride illegally for that very reason. For passengers, you're getting into a car without knowing if the driver is licensed by TLC, therefore, and therefore screened for safety. You may be, you'd be getting into a dangerous, uninsured vehicle. The vehicle may not have been inspected. And we do know that many reported instances where drivers and passengers have reported assault have involved unlicensed activity. Intros 9, 6, 7, and 13, 19 would require that taxis, street hail liveries, and for hire vehicles have panic buttons in the rear com passenger compartment and in reach of the driver's seat, capable of sending distress signals to the New York City Police Department. In those rare instances where there is a problem, TLC wants drivers and passengers to receive emergency support as quickly as possible. We must defer to other agencies who are more familiar with the capabilities of emergency response technology. Um, but from a TLC perspective, I do want to note that the bills as drafted are currently silent as to who would bear the costs of any new vehicle equipment. And without a full assessment of the technology, we of course don't know what these costs might be. We do know, I think everyone in this room knows, that drivers are struggling to meet expenses. And so we have to be concerned, and I want to put it on the record, that we have to be concerned that for our drivers, many of whom own or lease their vehicles, um, we want to be careful that they may be on the hook for paying not only for the installation, but presumably for ongoing maintenance costs and any monthly tech, you know, carrying charges for this technology. Turning to intro number 1302, which would require TLC to establish a minimum base rate that must be charged to passengers for trips dispatched by any high volume for hire service that begin and or pass through the congestion zone recently created by New York State tax law in 2018. The minimum base rate under 1302 must be no less than the initial base, the initial unit charge for a taxi and any required taxes, fees, or surcharges. This minimum base rate in taxi is referred to as the drop charge. The new state law defined the congestion zone as Manhattan, south of 96th Street. For trips in yellow taxis that begin, end, or travel through the congestion zone, state law required that passengers pay a congestion charge of 250 per trip, while for trips in for hire vehicles, passengers were to be charged a per trip congestion surcharge of 275 although that surcharge, as you know, is reduced to 75 cents for shared rides. It is important to note that the congestion surcharge is not in place today. Although that law was supposed to take effect on January 1st, 2019, there's litigation challenging the congestion surcharge. A New York State Supreme Court judge issued a temporary restraining order in joining implementation of the surcharge on December 20th of last year and just last week, on January 17th, the judge ordered further briefing and temporarily extended the restraining order until January 31st, 2019. Currently then, the state congestion surcharge is not in effect. Given this, I would urge the council to wait until the litigation is resolved and the outcome is known before considering legislation. Additionally, however, legislating a minimum for higher vehicle fare now appears to conflict with recent legislation from this committee. 
In August 2018, as you know, the Council passed and the Mayor signed several bills governing the for hire vehicle industry, including Local Laws 147 and 150, which Intro 1302 would amend. In addition to Local Law 147's moratorium on the issuance of new for hire vehicle licenses for one year, Local Law 150 requires TLC and the City Department of Transportation to evaluate the impacts of high volume for hire services on New York City. And just as a reminder, I know you know this, Chair, but for hire vehicle service, the high volume for hire services are those bases that dispatch over 10,000 trips a day on average, and currently that would be Uber, Juno, Via, and Lyft. So Local Law 150 required TLC and DOT to evaluate the impacts of high volume for hire services on New York City, including impacts on congestion, driver income, and air quality, among others. That study must be completed by August 2019, after which the Council, in Local Laws 147 and 150, authorized TLC to take a variety of policy actions, and also to, quote, determine whether the establishment of minimum rates of fare to be charged by vehicles licensed by the Commission would substantially alleviate any of the problems identified in the study, end quote. We understood that the Council's decision in Local Law 150 to require TLC to complete this study before making any determination as to minimum fare setting was designed to ensure a rational process that considered all the relevant factors similar to how TLC evaluates potential taxi fare increases, or how, for well over a year, TLC evaluated whether and how to implement the recent driver pay standard. So Local Laws 147 and 150 pressed the pause button to allow the TLC and DOT to examine how best to evaluate the impacts of high volume for hire services on New York City and how best to address those impacts. Without completing that council mandated study, TLC cannot know those potential impacts, the impacts of setting a for hire vehicle minimum fare on issues like congestion, driver income, traffic safety, or on outer borough vehicle availability, wait times, and fares. And we think it would be irresponsible at this point to regulate fares prior to that thorough evaluation. Thank you for inviting us to testify today, and I will take your questions after the police department has testified. Good morning, Chair Diaz and members of the Council. I'm Oleg Tranovsky, the Department's Executive Director of Legislative Affairs, and I'm joined here today by Deputy Chief Richard Napolitano from the NYPD's Information Technology Bureau and our colleagues from the Taxi and Lim Limousine Commission. On behalf of Police Commissioner James P. O'Neill, we're pleased to testify about two of the bills being heard today. At the core of the department's mission is our obligation to protect the health, safety, and welfare of those that live, work, and visit this city. To this end, the department has leveraged technology and technological advancements to drive crime to lows not seen since the early 1950s. This includes the use of technologies such as shot spotter, smartphones, Argus cameras, and the domain awareness system, which integrates a multitude of technological crime-fighting tools that better equip our officers to keep people safe. However, our push toward technological integration does not end at advancements in crime fighting alone. It naturally extends to emergency response. The Department of Technology and Telecommunications, of Information Technology and Telecommunications, is spearheading improvements to the 911 system with a goal, with a long term goal of bringing the entire emergency system into the next generation. This is no easy task, and this department is actively involved in that effort. Annually, our 911 call centers receive approximately 9 million calls for emergency service. This is why any change to the system, no matter how slight, requires significant thought, analysis, experimentation, validation, and piloting prior to full integration. This is not a quick process, nor should it be as any failure of a request for emergency response to connect to the department or inability of the department to accurately determine the location of an emergency call can cost a life. This is simply a cost too great to bear for the sake of prematurely implementing even a good idea. The NYPD welcomes any and all innovations that will help us achieve our mission. 
This is why the department supports the goal of greater access to first responders in cases of, em in cases of emergency. Envisioned in intro 967, sponsored by Council Member King, and intro 1319, sponsored by Council Member Cumbo. Although I want to be clear, there should be no substitute for callers phoning in to 911 where possible to enable our call takers to elicit what is often vital life saving information. These pieces of legislation require the installation of a panic button in every livery cab, hail, and for hire vehicle that can connect drivers and passengers to the police department. These bills seek to create another avenue in which the city can leverage technology to not only help prevent and solve crime, but to also connect those in distress to emergency services. However, while we agree that the integration of this technology, both into such vehicles and into the 911 system, may prove to be significant, it is important to stress that the department does not currently have access to the GPS system installed in such vehicles if GPS is in fact installed in all such vehicles, which is a vital component of having the ability to gain accurate location data. Additionally, TLC data, such as license plate information and vehicle description information, would need to be integrated into the back end system. In busy locations, officers may respond to a scene and see multiple taxi cabs or four hire vehicles that look identical. Relatedly, as companies such as Uber and Lyft have proliferated, it has become increasingly difficult to differentiate for hire vehicles from personal vehicles. This is, partic this is particularly why the panic light that is currently installed on taxi cabs would need to become a requirement for all vehicles covered in this legislation. The presence of such lights and their integration into the scheme the bills envision would enable responding officers to more quickly identify and respond to the relevant vehicle. These significant hardware installations and software upgrades, together with the, require, with the required testing and validation of such a system and training for all of our 911 call takers, would take significant time and certainly could not be accomplished in 120 days as envisioned by the proposed legislation. I want to stress that although there are current challenges to immediate implementation, this does not mean that this idea cannot be explored in the future. Indeed, the city is in the process of developing next generation 911, which will provide significant upgrades to our current 911 system, which p potentially could be successfully leveraged to utilize technology such as what is proposed in this legislation. We welcome a continuing dialogue with the Council relative to this issue. Thank you, and we look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you to both of you, Mr. Oleg Church. How you pronounce, how you pronounce your name? Chernovsky. Chernovsky. Okay. <clears throat> Let me, let me ask you a question, yes or no? Does the NYPD support or does not support the panic button? Well, I think, as I tried to explain in, in the legislation, it's not really a yes or no question. It's yes, we support the idea of getting somebody that is the victim of a crime immediate access to the police department, however that may happen. Now, there are currently challenges with simply saying, yes, put a panic button in every, in every car, because there's also a back end and uh, a back end component to this, and the requirement uh, would really need for officers to be able to distinguish these various vehicles. I mean, the example I tried to make is imagine that there is a panic button that gets hit in a yellow cab, and we respond to the corner of Broadway and Canal Street, and there are five yellow cabs there. How would we know which yellow cab <coughs> pressed the button? So there, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of issues that need to be worked out. But the concept of getting people, whether it be the driver or whether it be a passenger in a four hire ve vehicle or yellow cab, quicker access to the police department to emergency response is certainly something we're in favor of. So how do you? <coughs> <coughs> How do you see 
The passenger, the passenger will have a panic button. The driver will have a panic button. Uh, <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm a little bit not clear on who's or why the panic button has to be uh, uh, pushed. Because it could be that the life, the passenger feels that, that he or, or, or her life is in danger. But what about if they are discussing about politics? One like Trump, the other don't like Trump. And because they don't like Trump, or though I like Trump, someone, one of the two will push the button. Well, I, I mean, I think... Because my life is threatened because I, I mean, thought that this guy, because he doesn't like Trump, or I like Trump, uh, my, life, my life is in danger. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I certainly agree that people shouldn't be hitting a panic button based on their like or dislike for the president. But I, I think that the idea conceptually is about a real emergency, and I think, uh, I'll tell you, you, you raise a, a very interesting point, because what the balance, what I'm saying is that although we want, we want faster access, whether it be a panic button or whether it be some other form, faster access for victims of crime to the police department, these are one of the issues that need to be worked through. It's not only the technological hurdles, the software, the hardware, but it's also the abuse of the system. And how, how do we work through what is the best way to connect That's victims of crime to the police department through a system that will not be abused? Or there, should there be safeguards created whenever you implement the system? So for example, if this, the system proposed in these bills were to come to pass eventually, there would also have to be an analysis done about uh, false alarms, about people pressing the button and diverting police resources away from real emergencies to respond to an argument over politics, as you mentioned. So these are all things that need to be considered yeah. in, in designing such a system. Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's a good idea, but my concern is how do, how do we, dif how we will dif differentiate from the real, the, the the real danger than somebody that just, uh, I, I don't like this driver, I don't, uh, whatever, and I'm gonna push the button, and then I'm gonna claim something. How do we know who's for real or who, who's not? I think, um, excuse me, I think, um, I, think you're say, I think what you're saying is right, that it's, this is why I think a longer term conversation needs to happen, not only about the technology, because certainly, the bill has an effective date, both bills of 120 days. I, I don't think, I think everybody would agree that we're not there yet. But beyond the technology, hardware, software, this is the conversation that needs to happen. I think all of the relevant stakeholders need to get in the room, PD, TLC, the council especially, and talk about not only what needs to be done and what the best way to do, to do that is, but also how to create safeguards against people abusing the system to make sure that what we're actually getting are real emergencies and we're not getting disputes over politics or or you know people that have you know after a night of partying night out on the town pressing the button because they had a little too much to drink i mean these are the sort of things that we need to we need to think about we need to talk about we need to address uh because Although it's a good idea to connect people to emergency service faster, what we can't have happen is emergency service responders being diverted from real emergencies to answer false calls. Yeah, I have asked my staff to, to look onto that too because uh, it, it could be a problem. Also, it could be a burden for the driver because drivers nowadays, they are victims, but they, they, they are blamed for anything. So anyway. Let me, let me, I think we're going to come back to you, but let me ask the TLC a question. Mm -hmm. Regarding, regarding introduction 1302, mm -hmm. are you opposing that? Yes. I'm not opposing it. We're not opposing it. What we're saying is, one, 
the surcharge, I think this is a response to the state surcharge. The surcharge is under not only being litigated, there's a temporary restraining order. There's litigation naming the city, naming TLC. So I think it's early to gauge a response. But two, we, our office, your office, went through a very long process over last spring and summer with this package, this pretty historic package of regulation that you shepherded through that put a moratorium on new vehicle licenses, that created a new licensing class, that directed us to do a very thorough study for a year of many factors before we determined whether we should, after the moratorium ends, whether we should put additional limits on the number of for hire vehicle licenses, whether we should establish a vehicle utilization rate. It also said that after the study, we should consider whether or not to set um, a minimum rate of fare for all of the vehicles we license, but that obviously um, included for hire vehicles. And it said that if we, have, if we made that decision at the time that doing that would alleviate some of the problems identified in the one year study, we could then set a minimum fare, but taking it, it gave additional factors that we have to consider. So it set forth a, a process which is pretty similar to the process that we went through when we set the, the new driver income rules that was, and, and that process was um, also set forth in local law. And it's similar to the process that we go through when we do a, uh, a fare increase, you know, every two years we have to have a hearing on, on the minimum fare, on the, the lease cap amount. So the concern is that, the question is we just, had this legislation, it just set forth the process. The concern is that if we circumvent that process, I think we're making any, any action vulnerable to attack, not just criticism, which we can handle, I know, I know you can, but, but well, legal attack. Well, I, just, I just want everyone to know, and, 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 and the commissioner to know, <clears throat> that I put that, we put that bill together based on the commissioner recommendation. <coughs> because uh, I have here a, a newspaper uh, from the w w Wall Street Journal, mm -hmm. November 19 mm -hmm. of 2018. The commissioner speaking to uh, the people there, she said, the, the paper reads, Taxi and Limousine Commissioner Mary Jossi said Monday that other sectors of New York City for higher, for higher industry, such as limousine and app-based ride, ride hailing services, have more flexibility to absorb congestion fee. Then she said, they are not bound to meter it, meter it fair, so they can reduce the price of the trip so that the passenger doesn't feel the effect. She said in a statement following a city council oversight committee. Mm -hmm. So she, she, now she's opposing you. I don't understand. I don't know. I didn't say she's opposing I'm confused. You. Right. I, I an interesting thing has happened since that article, which is the city was sued and TLC were sued. And we were sued specifically on, and the state on the congestion surcharge. But the judge entered a, a temporary restraining order. So we're in litigation right now. That's not, I don't think that something has nothing to do with the other. I mean, we had to prepare. Mm -hmm. See, it, 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 the good action is that you always prepare for the worst I mean, you prepare for the best, or hoping for the worst, or, or prepare for the worst, hoping for the best. You prepare in advance. You don't wait. Let's sit here, and let's wait to see what happens. And then when it happens, oh, we got to do this. We all know that the judge uh, held the, 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 the fair. Mm -hmm. That's no. The judge might come and say, forget it. But the judge might come and say, go. Mm -hmm. So, ain't, we, ain't, ain't it would be better for us to be ready? 
I am for under whatever delusion. Reason, okay, the judge said go, we ready. I, I, I understand your point. I'm under no illusion that TLC can control your actions on legislation, and it's your prerogative, obviously. No, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I don't want to, I've been accused of being something, I, but I, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, and I'm not. I just want to be clear. If she of the commissioner says, we put that bill together because of the commissioner said, what she said, she said, this is, this is gonna hurt the driver, the, the delivery. The, the, the Uber and the other guy, they could do this. But the other drivers have been gonna be punished. So we say, okay, let's make it fair. Everybody, the Uber and whatever cannot do anything. They all have to do the same thing. That's what she said. And we put the bill. Now she's saying, no good. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely familiar with the history. Um, as I said, TLC is named as a respondent, the city is named as a respondent, Chair Zoshi is named as a respondent. So I really can't comment on this because we're under litigation. Okay. Uh, it's any day or left. Do you want, you want a question? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first, I'll make a statement and then I'll come back um, to one or two questions that I have. Um, this intro that came up didn't just come out because one day I was just randomly sitting around and said, hey, let me come up with some legislation with taxi drivers. There's been a number, there were a number of incidents that occurred in the borough of the Bronx and beyond, um, and about 150 drivers came together with base owners, with Commissioner Goshi, uh, NYPD, a couple of different precincts, and myself um, to discuss what can be done with all these drivers that are being robbed, shot, stabbed and fearful of their lives. Out of that conversation came an in, uh, this intro to figure out how do we save the lives of the drivers who are really vulnerable while they have to look in one direction and not having the luxury of looking over their shoulder regularly while they're driving a car other than looking in the rear view mirror but still got them managing the road. Out of that came this panic. But so as I'm listening to your conversation, um, it appears that there isn't nothing in the way that really can obstruct us from achieving the goals of making sure that the driver is safety, other than time, other than a little bit more research and figure out the fiscal impact that will happen if we were to implement this. Is that a good, fair assessment of your testimony? Yeah, yeah, I think, I, I, I think we're saying the same thing, that I think okay. over, over t it's time, absolutely, because right. we're not there yet in, in a lot right. of ways. But during that time, let's, let's have the conversation, but not necessarily limit ourselves to panic button. Maybe during that conversation we're going to figure out a better way to allow drivers that get put in these very dangerous situations. I think everybody's acknowledging that. You know, we, whether it's the passenger or the driver, we don't want either party to be fall victim to a criminal or a crime. So whatever it is, whatever the best solution is, I don't want to hamstring all of us to one solution, but I think that's why what we're saying is we support the goal of your bill. Your, the goal of your bill is to protect drivers against being victims of crimes. And we support that goal 150%. And let's have a conversation, figure out what the best path is moving forward to achieve that goal. And if it turns out at the end of that conversation that it's panic buttons, then great. If it turns out that we can figure out a better way to do it, then that's great too. Okay, I thank you for that. Uh, I, I believe we're all on the same page, uh, whether I can say whether it's a button or uh, that button signals a light because I do understand, yes, you can ride in and seven cars look alike and who pressed the button? Uh, but just like New York City buses, when the driver presses his emergency buttons, the lights flash, the sign goes across emergency 911, so everyone knows that that bus is in, in, in distress. Figure out that technology, and I understand um, how the GPS system you're saying we're not connected to, but again, that's a conversation that we all can have where we're all on the same page to make it work. So um, I'm looking forward to have more conversations. And you mentioned about the 120 days. I, I can concur, 120 days might be um, an aggressive uh, plan to try to make it happen after we sign legislation. But what I would ask us to do, though, is have these conversations now and not let them drag on six months, then revisit it again, and then look at, you know, 
we're back in 2020 before 2021 before we're able to implement it and by that time we'll be having more stats of how many other drivers might have got killed shot robbed and the goal is to minimize it today so what i would ask us if we can figure out by the holiday season time that we might be able and i'm talking about the winter season that when when people have money and people are going after the drivers being able to have this implemented by then. So we're in the beginning of the year, we're in January. I'm talking about maybe at least a seven, eight months conversation of putting stuff together to see by, by at least November, we might be able to roll out some. Do you think that, that that's a logical plan or thought process? You think that can be done and we can come together in the next 10 months to see if we can make something like this come to fruition? I think we can start the conversation immediately and where that conversation will take us, it'll take us. But I think at least we start the conversation with having the same goal. Okay, I appreciate it. So um, the committee, and I know my office will be reaching out to you to start those conversations as soon as the second month of the year. And we're in the first month now. So we want to start in the second month of the year. So by the 11th month of the year, we could be implementing something that will save the lives during the holiday season. Um, I want to ask you a question in regards to, just following up what the chair was mentioning in regards to the congestion. I just want to know, um, my, the, I have three questions here jotted down. The first one I want to know, do you, do you know how many rides were, were taken in high volume for higher vehicles in the congestion zone during 2018 and what that monthly average look like? I don't have that right now, but I, I will definitely get that for you. Okay, because I'm trying to get get a feel of how many, how much traffic is actually flowing. We looked at this generally a few months ago, and I have a memory, but I don't I don't have it in front of me. So, but I I know I can get you that, and just to be sure I have it right, what you would like to know is the number of trips in the congestion, the total number of trips in the congestion zone for 2018, <clears throat> and then broken down by month. Right. And then I, I would like to give you for 2018 the average uh, daily trip volume. Yes. Thank you. Because I want to get a feeling of how much traffic we do have really coming down. How much money do you think with this moratorium that did we lose any money? How much money would you have gained if this moratorium wasn't in place right now? And like to get an idea does how many folks from different areas do you think this is stopping people from coming in from different areas um, per se the Bronx um, because they might be charged? I do know that to the extent people from the Bronx are taking, um, to the extent they're taking livery or they're taking green into the city, into, I apologize, into Manhattan, into the congestion zone, um, those trips, uh, those numbers are not particularly high compared with taxi and compared with the high volume for hire services. Mm -hmm. um, we can, this will take a little bit longer, but um, we, could take a, we could take a look at um, number of trips by origin, but your question really is what, what sort of impact might this, might this have? I'm not sure right now. I know that every time there's been an increase in the yellow fare, uh, there has been a, 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 a small decrease in trip numbers. So, um, I just, I'm asking questions because I just want to make sure or get an idea on the record because sometimes we have best intentions and sometimes mm -hmm. Um, legislation can be discriminatory, unintended consequences that can be discriminatory, um, especially when we have five boroughs and we're talking about Manhattan and, um, mm -hmm. you know, Manhattan is still part of the five boroughs. It's not an entity off by itself, Correct. just as Queens is and just like the Bronx or Brooklyn or Staten Island. So how do we make sure that everyone has equal access to parts of the city of New York and that we don't get priced to stay out of it? Um, or we get price to come into it. So I just want to get an idea because as we talked about the drivers getting killed, uh, you know, their ethnicity, their, their, their story is different than maybe someone else who's driving in midtown Manhattan who can afford to stay in this circle where off, you know, if my means of an income in different parts of the borough, the money is not flowing. How do I get charged to go into another part of the area where there is more money flowing? I, I think, Councilman King, we're very concerned about any increase in passenger fare in any sector. We're very concerned about the, the, what impact that has on people and their ability to get around. And that's one reason why in the local laws uh, that the Council passed and the Mayor signed in August, it set forth um, 
the requirement to do a study of various factors of the impacts of for hire vehicles and particularly the high volume for hire services on factors like driver income but also on service availability. And any increase in fare, we're supposed to look at how that might affect service availability, meaning whether people in um, you know, non-Manhattan core who lived in those neighborhoods who were getting trips, whether they would be impacted by that, either because there were fewer vehicles and therefore fewer trips, whether wait times were going to be increased either by, a more, you know, by the moratorium on vehicle licenses or by any increase in fare. And so those are all the things that we think, A, that we were charged by council to look at. Those are the types of things we look at when we increase fares in yellow. Those are the types of things that we looked at when we set forth the driver income standard. And those are the types of things that we would want to look at before we regulate um, a new base fare for for hire vehicle or just for the high volume for hire services. Well, I thank you for that. Um, I just ask us all to continue to be fair in all our assessments. New York is a great city to be in, and while we are diverse, we still have our issues on our diversity, and some of our policies and rules do make it more difficult uh, for every New Yorker to have access. That's just the reality, and, and I don't want us to ever be in a hearing and ignore that those are our realities for certain individuals who are certain New Yorkers. Um, I'm just going to go back to um, the panic button communication with NYPD. And I, when we start talking about fiscal impact, um, I want us to be able to see if we as a city can make sure that we are putting, putting our money where our mouth is. Recently, um, myself and Councilmember Joe and I, uh, we had introduced legislation in regards to putting panic buttons on the safe haven zones in, in the city of New York after Junior was uh, viciously murdered at a bodega. Um, I've learned last week or the week before that City Hall, so that's, um, NYPD has put a panic button in the store that Junior was killed in, as well as new technology and cameras all around the store that should make our grocery stores or anybody who wants to be part of the safe haven a little um, safer. So if we're able to do it at such a level like that, that means NYPD does have some sense of technology to do something like this. So there is some type of president. Even though we're on the same page, I just want to put that on the record because I don't want us to hold ourselves hostage to time when, it, when there is a path for us to move this as quickly as possible as we can. So I just wanted to put that on the record. And thank you all for that technology for the safe haven. I'm looking forward to working with that now, Bodegas, as well as making sure our taxi drivers are safe. So, Mr. Chair, thank you for today's conversation. I appreciate it. Thank you for all for your testimony. Thank you, Council Member King. It's always an honor and a pleasure to work with you. I'm, I'm a co-sponsor with you, or the party bottom for the drivers. Yeah. So, so um, you know, going back to to what I was saying before, we all know that a new commissioner is coming because the commissioner, I heard that she resigned. So I, my advice is that we should do, or the commissioner, we should prepare and do everything possible for the next people, person that comes to get it easier, and to get things done, and, and don't let all this papita caliente do you know what's a papita caliente? No, sir. A uh, hot potato. Okay. <laughs> I got the caliente, <laughs> but I wasn't sure what was hot. So I, I, I don't want to ask you no more questions. I, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. None of you. So uh, I'm, I thank you for being here today. I, so uh, I, I hope that today we have a good understanding that, that I, we are working. I think we. I. I I hope we have a good understanding as well, and I, I just, again, want to emphasize on 1302, our, our point is that there's a whole process here that was, and it was set forth by council about the types of things we need to look at and the things we follow and the process we need to follow. And so that's why we were confused right. to see the legislation mandate that direct result. Right. And my point is, again, that even though the, there's a litigation about the 1302, uh, we don't lose anything by being ready mm -hmm. and getting something already prepared. And 
And if the judge decided that the, 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 the fair goes, we ready. But for us to wait until the judge decided, the court decide mm -hmm. what's gonna happen, mm -hmm. for us to start preparing, people, uh, we, we're not doing a good service to the, to the drivers and to, to the industry. I think that we should, be, we should be ready for whatever, always, whatever. Sometimes they announce that they're gonna snow and the city prepare for the snow and there's no, there's no snow. But all the time, they, the city doesn't prepare and the snow come and the mayors cut unprepared. So we all be prepared. So thank you very much for being here today. I thank you very much. Thank you, thank thank you. you Mr. Chair. Can I? We have been joined by Council Member Moya from Queens. I'm going to call Richard Blisky, Charles Komanoff, Brian Lozano, and Diane Clemente. Two minutes. We're going two minutes. Two minutes each. Mm. Mr. Lipsky. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> philosopher Alastair McIntyre once said that bureaucratic wisdom is one of the great moral fictions of our time, and I think we saw an example of that in the testimony of the. Uh, city uh, commissioners. But before I go into a little more depth on that, because um, I'm here to talk about three, 1302, but the panic button issue is intertwined with that because the police are talking about how do we identify which car and which taxi. Very simple. If they had a system that was integrating through technology like taxis have with a TPEP computer system, then it would be very easy to integrate the panic button with the computer system, and you'd know exactly which taxi or for hire vehicle had that uh, particular problem in their vehicle. So everything comes back to the fact that we lack regulatory parity between the sectors. Now, in reference to uh, the TLC, the question is, if we wait, and the commissioner um, tried to avoid what uh, Chair Joshi had said, and you pointed out in your own remarks, that this could game the system. But we've already seen what has happened through the decimation of taxi over the last uh, two, three years. And what the commissioner is saying, this could really hurt folks, but this is a real life and death situation. So we're gonna wait for their study and how many bodies are going to be littering the streets while they finish their study. What the 1302 does is to create regulatory parity on the price of the drop fare because the TLC in three years didn't do its job, which was to regulate fares. So they allowed surge pricing, they allowed predatory pricing, they allowed these companies to come in and do whatever they hell they wanted to do in terms of generating business at the expense of the yellow taxi industry. And what we face now is a delay that is life-threatening. And we support 1302, and we support not only that, but we support connecting all of the four hire vehicles to the same kind of software integration that taxis have so we know who's on the street. One point before I finish, 
We have thousands of for hire vehicles, Uber, Lyft, uh, Via, et cetera, that come in from the airports, that come in from New Jersey, that come in from Westchester. They're not registered in the city of New York. And without connectivity, they are cheating the MTA and cheating the taxi industry of fares that belong to it through its franchise. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, Mr. Lipsky. You know, what I, what I was really threw me off is that I thought that the commission was going to be uh, excited to support this because this, this, is ba this bit, my bill is based on what she said. And she was supporting, and then now she said, Let's win. They're not good. I, that was that was that was my concern. It's two different point of view. One no, I, I I get that, and I think what you should have done was to relabel 1302 Joshi's law. It, 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 it was written based on what she recommended. I understand. And now she come and say, I'm against. I don't know, maybe I should And by the way, litigation has nothing to, to do with that. They're trying to punt. I understand that. Kick the ball, I, kick I, the I, ball I, down, uh, yeah. uh, wait but, for a year and a half. Doesn't matter. But, you know, that's what it is. It is what it is. Uh, my name is Charles Komanoff. I testified before this committee on November 19. I represent ta taxi medallion interests, but my analysis and opinions are my own. I have copies of my more detailed remarks, which I will summarize here. May I approach or thank you, sir? I fully support the intent of uh, INT 1302-2019, but recommend that we go further. There are many equities to be balanced here. Everybody deserves a better deal. Thank you. Four higher vehicle drivers want to survive. Motorists and truckers want to move and deliver. Transit users want subways that work and buses that aren't stuck in car traffic. Patrons of cabs, Ubers, and Lyfts want to be picked up promptly and to arrive on time. People on foot and riding bikes want fewer vehicles. And to repeat, drivers of four higher vehicles want to survive. I believe we can advance all of these aims simultaneously with this five-point plan. Number one, Albany rescinds its flat fee congestion surcharges on all four higher vehicles. They could do that today. Number two, New York City mandates and implements connectivity, as my colleague uh, Mr. Lipsky described, for app-based vehicles which taxis already have. They could begin to do this today. Albany enacts congestion tolls on private cars and trucks. They could do that in the budget session. During the run-up to implementing those congestion tolls, Albany phases in time-based congestion surcharges, including trawling charges on the app-based vehicles. And number five, Albany enacts congestion surcharges on taxis to go into effect only when congestion tolling is in place. Here's why this program is fair. Connectivity for app-based vehicles is fair because it's inexpensive and will ensure full compliance with regulations. Charging all motor vehicles to travel to or within the Manhattan core is fair since all motor vehicles contribute by their presence to congestion. It's fair to refrain from fully sur surcharging all of the four higher vehicles until private cars and trucks pay tolls to enter the central business district. I explain why in my uh, printed remarks. But beginning congestion surcharges for Uber and Lyft now is fair because unlike taxis, they have not paid for the right to operate in the taxi zone and because they now number seven times as many as taxi cabs. Surcharging all four higher vehicles based on time in the taxi zone, not the drop, but on time in the zone with a fare, is fair because it ties the surcharge to how much congestion each trip causes, and finally imposing an additional trawling surcharge on the app-based Uber and Lyft is fair because FHV trawling is a socially useless activity that is best addressed by making Uber and Lyft pay a price for it. 
Now, I outline what that program would look like. I uh, list you. what the benefits would be. We would have 15% faster travel in the heart of Manhattan. We would raise between a billion and a half and $2 billion a year for transit. Mm -hmm. Manhattan residents who should pay the most will pay more in toll in the new tolls and surcharges than Brooklyn and Queens residents combined, okay. and the number of yellow okay. cabs will be preserved. I'm happy to answer Thank you. your question. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good morning, Chairperson Diaz and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to address you today. My name is Diana Clemente. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Could you? Si alguien está ahí necesita eh, traducción, hay unos equipos para traducir. Anyone needs translation, there is uh, equipment. So you could raise your hand and the sergeant of arms provide you with one of the equipment. So I'm sorry. Sure. My name is Diana Clemente, and I am president of the Black Car Assistance Corporation, BCAC a nonprofit industry trade group advocating for the best interests of base operators and their drivers since 1991. I'm also the president of Big Apple Car and have worked in the industry for 45 years since starting as a customer service representative at age 16. I'm here today to speak in opposition to both intro 1319 and intro 967 as they relate to black car services. The BCAC recognizes and appreciates the intent of both pieces of legislation. The primary concern of traditional or legacy black car companies has always been the safety of our drivers and the clients we serve. The black car service sector has long been a stable service in New York City and across the metropolitan area for corporate clients. We provide vital transportation services for high-level executives, office workers, and clients of the corporate customers that utilize our services. Unlike the liveries that service the riding public and often are paid in cash, or the yellows who also service the riding public, some of whom also pay in cash, cash payment in the black car industry is non-existent. Since cash is non-existent, the chances of a black car driver being attacked is also almost non-existent. Less than 1% of our trips collectively are provided to individuals unaffiliated with the corporate and governmental agencies we service and the vast majority of our work is contractual. We don't service the public. The owner operators affiliated with our licensed bases either have a stake of ownership in the BCAC member base, as in the case of the cooperative groups amongst us, or have purchased or leased a franchise from the proprietary groups amongst us. Going back to the earliest days of our existence, the mid-1960s, 50-plus years ago, when radios or two-way communication devices were placed in yellow taxi cabs, the committee would be hard-pressed to find a half-dozen incidents, more likely even a single incident, of the type of activity that would warrant a panic button for either passenger or driver. Thank you. It is because of our safety record as well as the vetting of our drivers and the quality and range of services that the black car industry okay. has historically been exempt from similar FHV regulations. By seeking out BCAC member bases, our clients are doing their due diligence. They are entrusting their principals, employees, and their own clients with the appropriate operator. As premium prices are paid in comparison to those of any other industry sector. We have to move on. So, so go fast. It must <laughs> no, be a no, positive. It's finished. Your time is, your time is, you, already, you went all, all, twice your time already. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can I race through it? You don't. Nope. 
I, I'll, I'll go really fast. Is premium prices are paid no, in uh, No? On the record. Yeah. You, we got it. You got it? Okay. Got it. Yeah, okay, so then can I just read one paragraph? <laughs> one paragraph. I'm just going to do one paragraph. Further and on a more emotional note, we are an industry that, like the yellows, has been hit hard by the more than 80,000 additional vehicles providing for hire service. On behalf of all licensed black car bases, I humbly ask the committee to allow us to differentiate our service offerings from the others as we struggle mightily to survive against overwhelming odds. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chair, and thank you, for committee, for, committee for let the me, Let me, let me, hold on. Yeah. All, all the witness have two minutes. When you see, hear the, the bell, that means that the two minutes are up. Sorry. Thank you. Great. Um, my name is Brian Lozano, and I'm with Tech NYC. Tech NYC is a nonprofit coalition with the mission of supporting the tech industry in New York through increased engagement between our 700 member companies, New York government, and community at large. Tech NYC works every day to foster a dynamic, diverse, and creative ecosystem, ensuring New York is the best place to start and grow a tech company. And over the past several years, New York City has proven itself a welcome place for tech. However, New York's position as a tech hub and the continued growth of an industry is not a foregone conclusion. Rather, the continued success of our ecosystem will necessitate hard work, key investments, and smart legislation. Over the past year, the Council has proposed and passed a significant amount of legislation to regulate short ride share tech companies. And while some of these have been smart and well-measured policies, others have not. Intro 1302, which would establish a base rate for high volume for high service in the congestion zone, represents the latter and would have serious negative consequences. Last summer, the council, to its credit, passed a law mandating drivers receive a living wage. But unlike that legislation, the intent of Intro 1302 is not to support drivers, but to limit the amount of competition in the industry, which would be a detriment to all New Yorkers. The legislation would limit the ability of rideshare companies to compete on price and their ability to offer riders quality and affordable services. Intro 1302 also includes a potential minimum rate for shared rides, making this type of service less affordable. The City Council and the state have demonstrated their priority to increase the efficiency and utilization of, of for hire vehicles and shared rides are a key mechanism achieving these goals. Shared rides are something that should be incentivized, however, this proposal will have an opposite effect, preventing companies from offering competitive prices. When it comes to the shared ride industry, the council has too often relied on antiquated regulatory tools, failing to engage key stakeholders in finding a path forward that makes the most sense for the most New Yorkers. Those who rely on for hire vehicles, those who drive for a living, and those who worry about congestion. With a living wage for drivers already established as law, the council should be working to encourage industry competition, allowing different services and companies to offer the best prices and products. As for intro 967 13, 19, we support the intent and the goal of increasing passenger safety across all types of services. However, uh, legislation should be revised to ensure the industry is able to devise innovative solutions rather than merely installing a physical panic button. Um, and the rest of my uh, testimony is in front of you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. She did good. You read the whole thing <laughs> in two minutes. I was close. <laughs> <laughs> but by the way, before, you know, when you say that the, uh, the, per the introduction 1302 is not in to support drivers, how do, how do you, I mean, what well, with introduction 302, I don't know if you, under, uh, you really read the, the bill. The bill says that if we're going to do that, every driver, every car, everybody will have to do the same. We cannot, we cannot uh, give privilege to Uber and to leave and, to, and leave the other drivers on their own. If we're going to do it, it has to be equal, fair. So when you say we are not protecting drivers, I don't know where you're coming from. Uh, is, is that a question? Yeah, but if, if, I want you to clarify that to me. It, it's like we said, I, I think some of the laws that were, were positioned uh, relative to living wages, we support no, and they think- the, the, Your statement. Yeah. Introduction 1302 is not to support drivers. So I want you to clarify that to me. We believe that the shared rides are a very important part of, of providing affordable services um, and gives an opportunity for drivers to, to provide those services to passengers, and we think that this bill does a detriment to that. So if we have Uber taking advantage 
And, and, and we say, no, if you take advantage, you take advantage. And but, but you say, no, let, let Uber and leave take the advantage and the driver being disadvantaged. Because protecting drivers means everybody the same. That's protection. So you say introduction 1302 is not supporting drivers. I don't know what you mean, but thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Peter Mazur. Mr. Peter Mazur. Scott Roof Ruther. Scott. Who's Scott? Assis Ball. Aaron Smith. have a break for five minutes, okay? Sure. I'll be back. Let's hold for five minutes. I'll be back. Let me go to some place. Yeah, driver. I represent the Independent Drivers Guild. Okay. Oh. Mm -hmm. I know we have some, how you doing, Councilman? Mm -hmm. I know we have some difference of opinion, but in the middle of the day, how we can make sense of this world. Yeah. That's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. I don't know if you read mine. I'll start reading it. Okay. Um, did we give that picture? They have it? No. Yeah. Yeah. Some yeah. variation between the different base types. As I hope I'll explain here, uh, I, I don't think any of this applies to the luggage <laughs> differences. So, she got an investigation. No, no, no. Councilman King, as a driver, we are together with Aziz.
Okay, we're back on business. Uh, I have been joined by Council Member Constantinides. Thank you, sir. Good morning, Chairman Diaz and members of the committee. My name is Peter Mazur, and I'm General Counsel to the Metropolitan Taxi Care Board of Trade, an association representing owners of more than 5,000 licensed medallion taxi cabs. We also provide an array of free services to drivers of these taxi cabs, including free representation in traffic court before oath and in criminal court for vehicular offenses. This service has saved our drivers more than a million dollars in legal fees over the past three years. There is no question the medallion industry is in dire straits. Ridership has plummeted over the last five years primarily because of the proliferation of the high volume for hire services that have flooded the streets with over 100,000 cars and whose fares are largely unregulated, enabling those businesses to reduce fares to levels below those charged by taxi cabs in order to capture market share. This situation is likely to, to worsen if a planned congestion surcharge temporarily enjoined by the courts were to take effect. Taxi cabs and street hail liveries must include the surcharge as an additional charge on the meter while high volume for hire services could easily absorb the increased cost imposed by the congestion surcharge by lowering the fares proportionately. This would hurt drivers in both taxi cabs and for hire industries as they will own less. Intro 1302 will address the problem by ensuring that these high volume services charge at least the basic initial rate charged in the taxi cab, which would be no less than $5.80 if the congestion surcharge were to take effect, but more is needed. To preserve driver incomes, all trips in these services should have fares that are no less than charged by taxi cabs or street hail liveries for the same time and distance traveled. It is much as this council and the TLC have stated that ensuring drivers a reasonable income is a priority. This goal cannot be achieved if the larger segment of the industry can undermine driver incomes by continually lowering fares to increase market share. To this end, the council should consider broadening, broadening the scope of the bill to restrict the ability of high volume for higher services to cut fares below those in taxi cabs in all trips, not merely those for the initial fare imposed within the congestion zone. Intros 1319 and 967 would mandate panic buttons available to both passengers and drivers, which would connect directly with NYPD. Drivers already have a panic button. It's not clear how this new feature would provide any additional protection to drivers or passengers. These bills presume that a signal to the police would generate an appropriate response, but it's not evident that there's a protocol in place to do so. For example, a similar initiative in Washington, D.C. was met with a flat-out refusal by the Office of United Unified Communications to integrate the emergency alerts into 911-311 systems. We could expect a similar result here. If I can just summarize at the end. No, no, finish reading. Yes, okay. Panic buttons will quickly be misused as complaint buttons, requiring emergency responders to intercede in uh, customer service issues unrelated to passenger or driver safety, distracting them from other priority calls. To be affected, a, tr a triggered panic alert requires an in-vehicle technology system to disable the driver's meter until the alert is cleared by the dispatcher, or in this case, the NYPD, a potential nightmare for drivers who could wait hours or even days for that clear the system response. Without integration to NYPD, taxi cab owners would be forced to pay third-party services to monitor, triage, and report panic alert messages on a 24-hour basis, an additional and a considerable expense to be borne by an industry already taxed to the limit. In short, driver and passenger safety, a priority, can be addressed in other ways. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify this morning. I'll be happy to answer any questions you. that you may have. Sir? Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning. My name is Scott Rutter. I'm the vice president of Limo Association of New York, which is a group of luxury limousine base owners here in the city. I'm here again today to respectfully request that the committee exempt luxury limousine base affiliated vehicles from any pending legislation regarding the installation of panic buttons and distress signals. And I'd like to ex explain the reason why our association seeks exemption from legislation which is intended to enhance public safety, a goal that we all share. We realize this effort is yet another response to the dramatic increase in vehicles affiliated with transportation network companies, or TMCs, that have driven the need for this new regulation. We feel strongly this is another example of regulation that is being applied across all FHV base types, when in fact it really has no application in the luxury limousine segment. The addition of nearly 100,000 vehicles over these past five years, all of, all, almost all of which are TNCs trolling around until so, uh, summoned by electronic, by electronic means to provide on-demand service, 
where the driver doesn't know who the passenger is getting into the car and the passenger doesn't know who is driving the car. By contrast, the high majority of our business is all prearranged work with established customer accounts. I would add that there is absolutely no cash involved. We know exactly who's getting in our car and our customers know exactly who we are. In the high majority of circumstances, many of these customers have been using us for months and even years on end. These customers won't press a panic button or a distress signal. They'll fire us and move on to another luxury uh, limousine base after researching and selecting one that will live up to their standards and who they want to use. Yet we keep getting swept up into many one-size-fits-all regulations aimed at the entire industry when in reality our segment has no impact on them. Uh, very quickly, a few of those are wheelchair accessible uh, vehicle when we don't provide on-demand service to begin with, data collection regulations uh, where we don't decide uh, where we're going to go, our customers decide that, congestion pricing, our uh, base uh, groups have lost about two, uh, 2,000 vehicles over the past few years compared to the 100,000 increase uh, in TNCs. So in conclusion, um, uh, I want to ask again that when you are deciding on this new regulation, whether it be the panic button issue or any others, that you please take into account the various different base types that exist within the FHV industry. Uh, and not lump us in altogether, especially when it's an issue that we have absolutely no impact on. Right, thank you thank very you. much. Thank you very much, Chairman Jazz. Um, my name is Aziz Ba. I'm a driver, FHV driver, and a member of the Independent Driving Guild. And today I'm here to talk about uh, intro 967 uh, 1319 in reference to panic button for both uh, riders and drivers. And uh, I think that's essential to have safety for both drivers and passengers. But now we can work directly with the app-based companies to integrate that feature into the app itself, as opposed to having drivers really go to like a third party, um, to a shop, extra expenses for those drivers and have them install that. That's an extra expense added to in the back of drivers that are already taxed at every single level. And actually, we're crying out loud right now that we cannot afford most things. The last thing we'd want to see is somebody really asking us to go through some um, uh, hoops in order to install a panic button. And I think with technology, it can be easily integrated and it can work very well and both passengers and riders can have it. And like I said, um, they already have a pilot program with certain apps and it's working perfectly fine. Now, in regard to um, 1302, the um, um, congestion issue, I've been driving for about five years and uh, I can tell you straight up, we are not the one causing congestion. For some reason, we are being blamed, but I think Putting the congestion issue where it is on the back of delivery drivers and personal cars, maybe that can address the congestion issue. <coughs> and it gonna, if implemented, it's going to really hurt people that are from the other boroughs. Those are people that are going to be paying the most, and uh, that's not fair to them. So as a driver, I can tell you, the congestion is not on our part. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sorry. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairman Diaz, uh, members of the FHV committee. Uh, my name is Aaron Smith, and on behalf of the Independent Drivers Guild and more than 70,000 app-based drivers that we represent, I write to you today to express concerns regarding intros 967 and 1319 in relation to panic buttons for drivers and passengers of street hail liveries and for hire vehicles. Uh, serving as a for hire vehicle driver is a dangerous profession and protection, protecting the safety of our city's drivers and riders is crucial. Uh, we appreciate the city council's interest in this area while we support the intent of both, panic buttons, of both panic button bills to improve driver and passenger safety, we believe that existing app-based technology offers a more practical and readily available solution. 
Uh, while all four hire vehicles, drivers in New York City are required to complete <laughs> fingerprint criminal background checks as well as, well as training and certification, uh, certi sorry, sorry, certification uh, exams, riders are not required to meet any such standards. At base dispatch, uh, systems eliminate some of the safety hazards long associated with anon anonymous street hails uh, and pickups, uh, but there are still far too many assaults on drivers. As a result of shared or pool rides uh, have increased, the threat to drivers have also increased, uh, with incidents of rider, with even incidents of rider on rider vi violence. Uh, this is why we need to be, uh, this is why we need to be pleased to uh, seek the app-based companies to begin to roll out emergency buttons within our, within their software applications for both passengers and drivers. App-based emergency buttons already exist uh, within the larger apps. And we, we believe that those are the best solutions to the drivers and the riders alike. Uh, they already use technology built in the app uh, to find out their exact location and provide 911 dispatch. Uh, already, and they're already piloting technology to help allow uh, the transmit of their location to 911 directly. Um, the alternative uh, to build some similar uh, capacities in the physical buttons, uh, it would just hinder a lot and it would put a big strain on the drivers. So we need all the help we can get. Thank you, Chairman Diaz. Thank you. Thank you for your participation. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. You have a question. Oh, hold on. Wait, wait, wait. Thank you, Mr. Chair. To Taxi Cab Board Trade, Peter Meiser, did I get it right? Yes, right here. So you mentioned um, that you have a really, a real strong um, uh this stage not really supported of the panic bill 13, 19, and 967. Now, you mentioned at the end in the short, drivers and passengers' safety and priority can be addressed in other ways. So, while I applaud and appreciate your testimony, one of the things that I do not support when people say no but don't offer a suggestion. Mm -hmm. So, if you're going to say no, what ways can we save drivers? Because you didn't share that. Okay, well, two minutes, it's hard to share. Uh, I had to address the bills that were before us as opposed to uh, rewriting a bill. Uh, I think you opened the door at the beginning of uh, your comments with NYPD, and the discussion really has to be uh, a conversation between the industry, the city council, the mayor's office, the taxi and limousine commission, and the New York City Police Department to come up with the correct solutions. We do have a panic button that's available for drivers now, as you're aware, which provides a light in the back. It isn't all that effective and hadn't been effective in the past because drivers, uh, NYPD responders tended not to know what it was or thought it was on by mistake, and a lot of drivers had the flashing panic button going on and, and, and nothing really happened. Our concern with the bill is, uh, I probably have a greater concern with the panic button for passengers because um, we see the kind of things that passengers will do. Oh, I don't like this driver. He's driving too fast. Hit the panic button. Though this driver moved, uh, I, I think he came a little too close. Maybe that light was red when he went through and he coasted through. It was yellow. Hit the panic button. Um, drivers are sophisticated. I don't think that we're going to find drivers using the panic button to any great degree without uh, there being a real emergency. Passengers, on the other hand, will use the panic button they call police for everything. They say, I didn't like the way the driver looked at me. I didn't like the way the driver um, let me off too far from the curb. I didn't like the way the driver slammed the trunk down when he took my luggage out. Um, and we don't want, I, I don't think our resources in the city should be invested in that kind of uh, interrelationship. And that, certainly that's not an emergency. Maybe if you can get, call 911 and get a police response and work it out, we can do something like that. We have a bigger problem. One of the problems drivers face every day is the problem of fare evasion, which is a huge problem in this industry. The passengers walk out without paying, um, and there's no relief for the drivers, drivers there. I think drivers are sophisticated enough. My concern with the bill as drafted is that I don't know if NYPD is sophisticated, is at the, uh, the level right now or will be at the level within a short period of time to integrate any kind of system into uh, an emergency response in, into a true 911 system 
Uh, you really need to have vehicle locators in every vehicle. You have to know the identity of the vehicle. You have to have uh, interrelationship between the Taxi and Limousine Commission and NYPD so that data, uh, and the TLC does have real-time data, at least with respect to taxis and street hail deliveries, where we know where the medallion number, where it is, who's driving it, and its exact location at any given time. Once we get through those hurdles, I think that's where the solution will lie. Uh, I'm not dodging and saying that, that I, I, that this, I, that this solution, um, I'm putting the, the solution aside and saying, you know, let you everybody else figure out the solution. I think the solution, um, we're not we're not far from where we would want to be, but we have to have the kind of integration. And whatever we do in the taxi cab industry, we have to make sure the same thing is done in the for hire industry, which maybe doesn't has have as much sophisticated uh, tracking mechanisms in place uh, as we now see in the. Um, in the taxi cab and the street hail livery side. So, so I think that's all I'm, I'm trying to say, and I, I hope I answered your question. You, you did, and I, and I want to say thank you, and I, and I just urge you, we consider you guys panels of experts, people in the field. So in the world of technology, us being able to send a man to the moon, we can't say that we can't sit here and figure out how to, and you said panic buttons. Panic buttons have to be a switch. You know, you have all kind of applications. It just hits you, whatever we call it. But I'm just saying, having some type of mechanism, whether it's on a smartphone or GPS, every base drive uh, owners, their cars are equipped with GPS. So these things already exist. It's just a matter of how do we link them, sync them, so we can protect our drivers. And that's where I hope this, I would like everybody's conversation to go, as opposed to just saying, no, because we have the right to say no, but being responsible because at the end of the day, if you're not sitting behind the wheel, it's not fair to sit here and have a conversation on no when you're not out there for 12 hours a day and trying to get home or not getting robbed, stuck, stuck, and, and so forth. So that's my conversation, but thank you again. I just want to get thank some you. clarity on the record, and we're looking forward to bringing everybody into the room when we have the next conversation. Okay. All right. Thank okay. You. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bridget Felix Raul Rivera. And Jose Rodriguez. The usual suspects. Mm -hmm. The usual suspects. They always go together. So, yeah, and then they go back. Okay. My, my name is Raul Rivera. I'm a New York City TLC driver. I was born and raised in the Bronx. Reset, reset, all right. My, my name is Raul Rivera. I'm a New York City TLC driver. I was born and raised in the Bronx. Finally, a bill I personally agree with. Drivers need protection. I'm a driver myself. If you truly want to help drivers, here are a few points to consider. Abolish the unconstitutional double jeopardy TLC rule, do it now. Stop wasting time and give drivers 80%, do it now. Cap drivers, do it now. Exempt all TLC drivers from congestion pricing, do it now. Tell, tell city council members to stand with Edwin Raymond and the NYPD 12, do it now. End the illegal NYPD ticket quotas, do it now. Ask the mayor why he redacted the $2 million Uber study, do it now. Ask the mayor why he gave away free parking to Enterprise and Zipcar, do it now. Reform the TLC and sign my petition, do it now. Save the role of public advocate, do it now. And on February 26, vote for Jumani Williams, the next advocate of New York City. These points will no doubt help all New York City TLC drivers. Let's put an end to this Trump-like commission and end this horrible nightmare once and for all. New York City drivers, unite. Choferes Unidos, Choferes Unidos. How do you say your name again? How do you say your name again? Your name? Raul, Raul Rivera. Raul? Raul, R-A-U-L, Raul Rivera. I'm okay, let's send that list and do it now. Okay, okay. Do it now, do it now. Okay, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Un segundo, un segundo. Me tengo que, me tengo que, I had an accident last night. I gotta go, I gotta get a new car. Okay, I appreciate the gracias. time. Uh, Reform the TLC. Bridget. Reform the TLC. <clears throat> Um, good morning. Um, my, my name is Bridget Felix. Um, I'm here. Um, I'd like to say that I am all for the panic button for the drivers. Um, I don't think that uh, it should be limited uh, at all. I don't think that the limo drivers will ever know if there is 
um, a passenger that has a gun inside and wants to shoot another person inside their limo. I think every driver should have um, a panic button. Uh, as far as the passenger, um, I've had complaints because I don't allow the passenger to smoke marijuana or drink alcohol in my car and they want to complain. Will the panic button be used for that? Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not for the panic button for the passenger, but definitely for the driver. Um, as, as we can see how TLC uh, Joshi um, never answers the questions and runs around your questions, I think that that bad habit is going to trickle down to the next commissioner. Can we just um, reform TLC completely, please? Please. Um, that's not that's not up to me. That's, <laughs> in, that's that's above my pay grade. It should be up to us as well. Uh, we need we need um, the rate for the drivers to get paid what was already established, not continue to cut it down. And then running around. Oh, now we need to research for another year. No, we need it now. Now, what are we waiting for? More suicides? Now, thank you. Thank you. Buenos días, Reverendo y los demás concejales. Mi nombre es José Rodríguez. Soy el presidente de la organización Taxi Driver de Fengro. Estoy aquí para dar mi testimonio respaldando el Bill 1302 que está introduciendo el reverendo Díaz, el cual yo creo que debe de ser de igualdad para todos los conductores de la ciudad de Nueva York, no con la desigualdad que se está manejando en estos momentos. Me gustaría hacerle una pequeña pregunta al reverendo de ser aprobado eh, esa pieza legislativa, si va a ser puesta en ejecución en vista de que para el mes de agosto aquí se aprobó una legislación de la regularización de las diferentes plataformas, el cual fue firmada y promulgada por el, el alcalde, entraba en vigencia el día 14 de noviembre y hasta la fecha, hoy estamos a 28 de enero, y la comisionada de sí ha desobedecido esa legislación que fue aprobada por el concilio. Good morning, I'm José Rodríguez, I'm the president of um, the Taxis Workers and Friends. Uh, and I, must, uh, I want to say hi to the Reverend and to the council members present here. Um, I want to um, want to talk about the the bill proposed 1302 uh, uh, because I'm looking for equality for all drivers. I want to ask the Reverend whether um, if that bill gets approved, if it's going to uh, go into effect, uh, when it's going to do so, because there was a law, a bill that was signed uh, by, approved and signed by the major on August uh, for platforms to, to hold them accountable. And it was supposed to enter into effect in November the 14th, and up to date, it hasn't do so. When is go that's going to be the case? En segundo lugar, eh, voy a hablar con relación al Bill 967 del concejal Kings. Eh, ese proyecto fue propuesto en el 2010, fue aprobado aquí en el concilio, el cual la ciudad desembolsó una cantidad de, de recursos para que eso se ejecutara, el cual nunca pusieron el primer dispositivo para defensa de nuestros compañeros del volante. Eh. Si estaría el concilio en la disposición de investigar ese proyecto que fue aprobado aquí cuando el alcalde era Mike Bloomberg en ese tiempo, el cual la, la Federación de Taxistas era la, la compañía, los que estaban al frente de ese proyecto y nunca se ejecutó. Uh, secondly, I want to ask about a project, uh, bill project, bill 967 that was proposed by the Councilman uh, Kings uh, that wa that took place in 2009 when Major the Major was uh, Major Bloomberg, and that was approved in order to set some funding for 
uh, safety devices, but n that never took place. So I want to know if there can be an inquiry or um, to find out when that's actually going to happen because it never took re it never took off. Nosotros apelamos a la sensibilidad de los demás eh, concejales que componen eh, los 51 eh, los 51 concejales que que están ahora mismo activos para que aprueben esta ley, esta, este dispositivo que vendría a ayudar a muchos padres de familia que día tras día salen a la calle a buscar el sustento de su familia, el cual andan indefenso porque la ley de usar el CIPER fue eh, removida, fue modificada y puso en desventaja a los compañeros del volante porque cuando andan con cliente a bordo y andan con el cinturón, no sabemos la calidad de persona que llevamos a bordo. Y si esa persona quiere hacerle un daño al driver, solamente tiene que agarrarle el cinturón y ahí lo va a dominar y va a hacer lo que le dé la gana con él. Pero con la aprobación de este dispositivo, estaría sobreguardando la vida de ese conductor. Muchísimas gracias. We want to appeal to the uh, common sense of the 51 council members uh, uh, to protect the life, um, the life of our colleagues that they, after they go out to work, uh, to get uh, the, an income for, for their families because uh, when this seatbelt law was taken away, um, that put us in peril because we actually don't know who, we're, who is stepping in into our cars and then that person can just grab uh, the driver by the seatbelt. But if this new law with the devices is approved, that would really help us uh, with regards to our safety. Thank you, thank you. We have been joined by Council Member Idanis Rodriguez, the Chairman of the Transportation Committee, and we have one more, the last one is Michelle Put Putin. Thank you. Michelle, you that you are the last one, we finish. See, they, they said that they leave the they left the the last for the the best for the last. Thank you, I appreciate Thank that. You. Hi, my name is Michelle Dotton. I am a driver first and foremost, and I am an IDG uh, steward. Help drivers every day. Uh, talk to drivers about safety. One of the main things that we have is the fact that drivers don't truly know who's behind them. And so, yeah, that seatbelt law was not a good idea to put it back in place that took away safety for the drivers. Uh, so we do have something in our apps already that can be implemented for the safety of drivers. The other thing I want to talk about is congestion. We're blame, being blamed for congestion. If we drive around the city every day, we look at all of the man-made reasons why congestion is happening. Streets are being turned into one-way streets, which should have been two-way streets. City bikes are all over, taking up almost a block or half a block in every which way you go. Bike lanes are now added, and then um, parking lanes are put in in the middle, and then an entire uh, area is taken away for for uh, bikes to ride. Then we have the issue where there's no way for us to pull over to drop off our passengers. We have no spots or very few spots where our drivers can even go to park to be able to go use the restrooms. So congestion should be pl blamed on everyone because trucks open their, their back hatches and they don't care how long it takes them to offload because they're where they need to be and everybody else has to wait or go around. So why are they not being charged a fee? Then on top of that, why, yes, I think if a regular person has to come in, then they should be involved also in the cost. We pay a tax that goes nowhere as an FHV driver. What are they doing with that money or that income that they take in? We also pay a back our fund fee that we pay that helps us out a little bit. So. In all, if you look at all of the things that's put on, let's be fair to everyone, not just FHV drivers, not just yellows. Yellow cannot take another fee put on their back. 
$5.80. Who's going to get in a yellow now? Are you trying to kill the industry or are you trying to help us? So we, do, we give a service to everyone. That, as you know, that's the gift of our beloved governor, not us, Correct. not the city. That's your friend upstairs. Well, he's not my friend. At this point, if we're looking to help people, then we look okay. at everyone. We should. Uh, but I think, everyone. but I think that you have you propose something uh, makes sense. Thank makes you. sense. Everybody should be uh, subject to the same pen penalty or, 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 or thing that you are trying to impose a driving. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank Ladies you. and gentlemen, this concludes our. For higher vehicle committee hearing this morning, thank you all of you for being here, for listening, for participating, and you took more time than no one. 